good evening and good afternoon wherever you are in the art world. Today, we at the Art Talks are delighted to welcome all of you in this uh, very, very interesting and uh, talk on, on women, women artists, how are seen in year 2022. I chose this date because we should we should be all celebrated every every single day of the year and not only on the 8th of March. And um, as Frida uh, Kahlo once said, at the end of the day, we can endure much more than we think we can. But are there, and believe me, <laughs> there are any, uh, still many challenges to overcome in 2022. So welcome to our wonderful uh, people, our wonderful women and uh, all the artists in the art world and in the art talks. So we are going to have uh, Barbara Loemi. Good evening. How are you? Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you? And uh, we are going to have, uh, of course, our uh, habitué Lisa Russell from, uh, uh, from Kenya coming to speak to us and uh, we are a bit scattered in all over the world and mm -hmm. of course we are going to have uh, um, the Affinity Gallery with director Olu uh, and is a wonderful curator Moni I see that they will talk a bit why they chose a wonderful exhibition that will be soon open next week in I am and nothing else. Barbara Bleming is the curator, curatorial director, uh, formerly uh, director of the Smithsonian National Design Museum and managing director at the Guggenheim and Guggenheim Hermitage Museum and director and chief curator of the Contemporary Art Museum of Virginia, Kemper Museum of Art Design and Hudson River Museum in New York. Wow, Barbara. <laughs> yeah. I was one of the first, I'm older, so I was one of the first women directors in museum and I started very early. <laughs> Didn't know what I was doing because there was no training for art museum directors when I started. So um, yes, and in fact, you know, you you were so kindly introduced by the wonderful Michael Klein. Yes, what how did it all start? So when you were there, where were the challenges before? And can you tell us what do you think are still the challenges today? Well very, and uh, Michael actually brought me a number of early um, women artists at the time, like Jackie Ferrara and a number of others who, um, Michelle Stewart, uh, I found, I always went for the most exciting art, always, and uh, contemporary art. My PhD actually was on a woman artist named Florine Stettheimer, who worked in the 20s and 30s. Um, and I, I actually, I just did this biography, which I couldn't get a single publisher in the United States of any publisher, my agent, to publish the biography, even though she was as well known as Georgia O'Keeffe, who's the best known other than Frida Kahlo, a woman artist in America, because they all said a book wouldn't sell. And I found Hermer publishers in Germany who published the book um, they, I say just publish 800, but they went ahead and published 2,000. Uh, it came out in January, this January. All 2,000 copies will have sold out by um, end of March, which is astonishing for an art history biography of a woman artist. But it shows how at least women artists are so hungry for stories of the history of women artists. But nonetheless, right now, I just read an article that 2,000 people in England were asked to name three women artists and they could not. They could not name three, which is incredibly sad in 2022. But throughout my history, I always put in women artists. And what's so sad is even women artists who in the 90s, which is when I started as a museum director, um, 
artists who had were in my museum exhibitions and had galleries then, like Michael Klein, who was a gallery director, can now not get a single gallery or museum show. They cannot get their work sold. And they had museum exhibitions in the 90s and were in Chelsea galleries. It, it, it's art museums in the United States 11% of art museum exhibitions are of women artists. Maybe 14% of museum collections have women artists in them. It is incredibly depressing when you think um, women got the vote in America in 1920s. Feminist artists have been, like the Guerrilla Girls, have been out um, campaigning in, in, for women to be equally represented since the 1960s. And we still can't get women in the art museums and art collections um, and exhibitions in America um, today. Incredible, incredible. It is so sad. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the world, but I think it's not that dissimilar. Well, I, I I think, you know, now we are getting better and better from what, you know, what I see that there are so many beautiful women artists that are celebrated and uh, all around the world. But I think, yes, that's true of young women artists and, and I'll say this women of color or uh, women of, 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 yeah, various races or different countries. Mm -hmm middle-aged women there's a funny thing you have to be either over 90 yes. or under 30 yes and preferably of color or some um very uh, small country to mm -hmm. be exhibited you cannot be the worst thing to be is a middle-aged woman white woman because then nobody will look at your work. The minute you say you're 50, oh, yes. nobody will look at your work. Yes, yes. Which is sad but, because their work, they have the most experience. They've been yes. working, you need to say a certain note. I retired um, at, about 13 years ago as a director of five museums. Uh, yes. And, uh, <laughs> I thought, what am I gonna do? All I've ever done since I was five years old is art. So I went back to look for the best acting conservatory in America and found mm -hmm. it in New York, the one Marlon Brando and Meryl Streep went to. And I am now a theater actress who's done three movies because I can do ugly, old, nasty women <laughs> and dysfunctional mothers. So I have a whole second career because I could not work anymore in museums because I was too old and was making too much money as a woman and women museum directors in America, there are very few, but they still make 30% less than men in in money. Incredible. Incredible. So anyway, it's, it's sad, but there are extraordinary women artists. Mm -hmm. So, and we're discovering and um, the 90 year old women artists are finally being refound. So if you're old, you're finally having your moment if you're a woman yes 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 i think you know we are we're getting but now for instance your book barbara could you tell us about yesterday because i'm in new york to see you well florian stenheimer was a wealthy new york artist who spent first 40 years in europe and people don't realize this picture was her turning her back on Europe. It's it's the same size as Manet's Olympia. She exhibited in the Paris Salon. And then before she left Europe, she made this Manet-like painting, the same size as Olympia, which is her, the first feminist nude by a female, 1915, where she's copying Olympia and saying, to men, male artists who do nudes, basically, I'm a woman taking back my own body, mm -hmm. right? 
and she painted and exhibited as much as George O'Keefe was her friend, but she was very wealthy. She priced her paintings at $3 million in the galleries. All the galleries in New York wanted her to sell with them, but she didn't want to sell her paintings. She did the designs and costumes for Gertrude Stein's opera that was the first avant-garde opera in New York that had all African-American performers. Um, she was Marcel Duchamp's closest friend, painted five portraits of him. Um, he organized her retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art when she died. Um, and he never did any museum exhibitions of another artist, so they were very close. And so she was very well known for the 20s and 30s and 40s in the United States. Uh, the uh, Lebenhaus Museum in Munich had a big show of hers that all the catalogs sold out in 1915. But when she died, every museum in America got some of her paintings. The Metropolitan Museum got four. But it was 1950, which was the time of the male big abstract expressionist works. So her paintings all went in the museum basements. So they weren't out in the galleries like Frida Kahlo and George O'Keeffe, which were also out of fashion, like her paintings at the time. But over the 60s and the 70s, the O'Keeffe's and the Kahlo's came on the market. And as they grew in prices, they grew in popularity. So suddenly they became very famous and they came out of the museums. Her works were never on the market. So they stayed in the basement, but they became cult figures among gay men because they're very feminine and she had a lot of gay paintings of gay friends she painted mm -hmm. and of women artists, a cult group. And so when um, I found her again, had a big show at the Whitney, but she went back in the, she was Andy Warhol's favorite artist. Mm -hmm because she painted all these fabulous pictures of New York that are at the Metropolitan Museum and the MoMA. MoMA, when they reopened, just put a big show of hers. And um, the Metropolitan has four huge six foot paintings of hers that are fabulous pictures of New York that you really, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum ever or the Museum of Modern Art in New York, they give huge room for her paintings. Anyway, um, so this book of 2000, it sold out in three months and they're now doing a second edition because it's selling out throughout Europe and America because she's now become famous again. So it's fantastic, but it's because people, women, are so craving refinding their history mm -hmm. in women artists. And she was so important, but because her work was all in museums, and when it came to the museums, the museums all wanted the work during the 1940s. Yes. But when she got to the museums, all it was out of fashion and went in the basement and it shows how much the art market which developed Frida Kahlo and Giorgio O'Keefe and so many other of the famous women artists in history that were still out in the market when the market isn't there hmm. the de reputation doesn't develop unless someone like me refines the artist in art history. Otherwise, these women artists are forgotten and lost. And as it is, in a, last year, the New York Times did a big article on me because I found four of her works that were fakes that were about to go on the market. And her painting of Duchamp, which was re authentic, went on the market and sold for a million dollars, which is why just shows that the work, there are like three works of hers that are not in museums, how much her value now is. There's one of her works left that's not in a museum, that's a very large painting, that the gallerist who has it is valuing at 10 million. 
incredible. So, you know, it, it, it shows a bunch of things. How much the art market mm -hmm. changes the value and reputation of an artist and how craving we... Um, uh, 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 many, many uh, still uh, university. Do you do more lectures? I still, I, when I'm asked, I will still give lectures. Uh, but what I've decided to do, one of the issues in, in America is art schools are a problem. They're, um, to make money, they're accepting too many students. And mm -hmm. so they're giving them too little room. And unfortunately, they're not telling their students the reality of the art world. They're still giving them the impression they're going to get a gallery and get into museums and be famous. There are too many artists, you know, and the and and frankly, the other bad statistic is 75% of the museum exhibitions go come from about 10% of the galleries in Chelsea, New York, or Los Angeles. 10% of the galleries, right? Only their artists, these like 200 star artists get recirculated in all the museums. All the other artists can't make a living from their art. So, and the art schools don't tell them that. So I'm now going and giving crit classes for seniors at art schools where I talk about the reality and, and the, the heads of the schools at the beginning say, Barbara, tell the students how to get into museums and galleries. And I get up and I say, you're not going to. The art world today, which is my art world, which I, my generation created is corrupt. Mm -hmm. It's old, it's corrupt. You're not going to get into it. You need to create your own art world of your generation that is totally unlike anything I can imagine. My generation, you mm -hmm. can't get into our corrupt art world. So don't try, make your own. Create new ways to find your own collectors of your generation. Create your own way to show art. Find you social media. Create ways we can't even imagine to show your art, to sell your art, you know, make a new art world. Because this art world is all about money. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's going to change? That's the problem. <laughs> no, that this art world about money and NFTs and art that sells in tax-free warehouses and no one ever sees it. It just moves from one financial asset to the other financial asset. That's going to keep going because wealthy people use art as financial assets. Yeah. That's going to go on just like banks and stocks go on. So artists need to find a new kind of art world. Because I use art world in quotes. I write Facebook about how corrupt the art world is and I have a huge following. So, you know, I made people, I'm not high, I'm not, don't rate, get paid anymore by the art world. I don't have a salary so I can say whatever I want. So I am known as being this terror in the art world. So I, um, we like you, we like yeah. you. that's why we invited you. <laughs> yeah. So I use art world in quotes for the wealthy 200 and I wrote a horrible thing just about collectors and and that's the art world and then I use art world in low case for everybody else who are artists who can't do anything but make art and mm -hmm. who are genuinely authentically live to make art but need to find a way to show it because you don't make art unless you want to show it mm -hmm you know, but can't live on what they make and don't have places to show it. So they need to invent ways to get their art up to, in front of people. Yeah. And I don't know how, they all write me, you know, how do I do that? I don't know. They have to find new ways because my world, when I was in the 70s and 80s, when I was a young kid and would bicycle around Manhattan, you could, they had a day a week where all the galleries, artists could take their portfolios and the galleries would look at them. Mm -hmm. 
it was the art world was small enough you could do that there was a day every week i think it was thursday where all the galleries sana ben mary boone all of them you would any artist could walk in and they could look at your work can you imagine no way that you, you can't get past the little dollies that sit men or women that sit at the desk now don't let you in they're intimidating right there's no way you could talk to Kogosian. yeah 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 but look we we fought barbara for for a bit with the pandemic the world would uh, change again and yet we have seen that nothing has changed and actually maybe we went worse after covid we are even in a war now things are really shocking it's our, uh, we are uh, seeing things that we would we would think today we would not see so but we're still we are still here uh, i well, the other thing is i just want to say one more thing yes what is this that with nfts you can buy a, an inch of an artwork that you can't even hang or own which is buying a, like a, a, a real estate lease, which is really all it is. You're paying money to buy real estate, an inch of real estate on an artwork that you will never have that they consider an art work. That is a financial asset. That has nothing to do with art. To this, I, I will have to bring Lisa Russell before I I ask anybody their beautiful comments about Britain from Farah and Erica. Because Lisa, you know, I think when you use any any tool in in life, you use it in a in, with a with a very uh, with an important message then it's useful so i think lisa is doing something amazing and, and barbara you, you will see in in the uh, she is uh, okay first of all prove lisa, me wrong yes, yes i would yes, love just, to have someone prove me wrong keep, because that's a new generation i don't understand yes yeah I, and i don't I, I i personally don't think it's right or wrong i just think it's um like I see it from a different perspective. So just to give some background about me, I'm, I'm an Emmy award-winning filmmaker. I've developed my career working at the UN. So throughout my entire career, I've straddled two very male dominated industries, the UN and global development and then film. And I have also um, worked with a lot of different younger artists, poets, musicians, filmmakers, or whatnot, hip hop artists or whatever, and cut through all these different art genres, it is male dominated. Um, and it really came to light for me when I got involved in following the NFT collection because the UN is trying to actually create sort of a, a movement towards more eco-friendly NFT um, collections and platforms and stuff like that. And what I realized is as I'm developing this new NFT collection for artists and storytellers who are interested in sustainable development, I've gotten really into the women-led and women-focused NFT collections. And there is actually some really beautiful art that you do own the copyright to, so you can print and put it on your wall if you want, but it's a different reality because working as a digital artist myself, I also know that we don't have the same revenue streams that somebody who can create a painting and sell it in a gallery has. It's like, once we do our work, it goes out, It's it can get stolen, there's no you know royalties sometimes, um, and so I think that the NFT and blockchain and crypto currency stuff allows digital artists to be able to monetize their work in a more responsible way and also have historical accuracy that you are the creator of that artwork and every time it's resold, it's not the collectors who are making money off of it. You also are able to, you know, create a collect, uh, create a percentage of it. But what was interesting to me is as I'm creating this idea for this NFT collection, I was like, okay, do I want to do a women-led 
women focused NFT collections and really target like women storytellers and women artists. I've reached out to this woman. I've been following her work forever. Who's been working on a, um, she has an organization called women in Hollywood. So even before it was a big thing, like it is now, she's been at the sort of front lines of really trying to push gender representation in Hollywood. And I reached out to her and I thought, wow, if I do this women led collection for women artists and storytellers, I actually mostly work with male artists. Um, again, like here, I, I'm in Kenya. Most of the artists I work with are men. Most of the poets I work with are men. Most of the beatbox. And, and so am I, is it, is it better for me to to elevate sort of, you know, I work with a lot of BIPOC artists, so is it better for me to put my energy into elevating sort of, you know, that community or should I really just focus on women and, and really try to elevate them? And it's, it's, I think it wasn't as clear to me on how biased my own world is until I started thinking about this NFT collection and who my market is and who my audience is. And, um, and I will say too that um, I've never seen a community around women as strong as I'm seeing the NFT collections. There are collections called, you know, World of Women, Women Tribe, Women Rise, all this stuff, and they're putting money. Even even some of the women celebrities in Hollywood have put together a, a collection to ensure that we're kind of challenging the systemic things that are keeping women out of the NFT space. Like right now you can do research and even looking at the artwork, like the male, male led NFT collections tend to be very gamey, tend to be very, um, I don't know, just art. I, it's just like maybe, you know, what Barbara's saying, it's, it's like, it's more of a financial token, but the women led pieces are actually have some really beautiful art. Like they're really focused on creating art in the digital space um and it's some of it's really beautiful but what they're doing is they're really they're creating funds they're creating foundations they're creating opportunities to really ensure that women are not left behind in this new craze whether it's to reap the benefits financially you know as a collector or just even as as creators ensuring that that women are are well represented in in that space so yeah it's been a you know i'm i'm excited to to be in this space again as somebody who mostly works in the digital space um and to actually see the community that's being built i would even i was even telling somebody i was like i feel more in a community at with this NFT stuff than I have with the UN NGO community who I've been a part of for almost 20 years. Like there's a, a, a certain elitist feel to it. There's a certain like hierarchy still that exists. Oh, you're not a UN staff and you're doing this. And I don't know, it's just, it doesn't feel very, it feels more competitive and more um, competition which pulls out that part of my personality. It's like, okay, well, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and, you know, I'm a practitioner and this or whatever, but the community in the NFT space is very um, welcoming, very diverse, very, um, I don't know. It's just, it's a really beautiful thing to see. And even men are in these N women -led NFT collections, changing their profiles on their Twitter pages to women um, in support of some of these some of these programs and these movements. So I I don't think you're right or wrong, Barbara. I just think that, um, you know, we work in different spaces and it's interesting to see um, both the, the, the ways that w women can benefit, but also the ways that women are, are still being left behind in, in all aspects of the different creative worlds. Um, no, I, just want to say something. Yeah. I, I think what you're doing is absolutely brilliant. I think all I was talking about and I'm limited to now that I'm listening to you is the handwork of the visual art of like painting and three dimensional sculpture. But I think the idea of digital art, um, music, um, anything, I, I would worry about textile painting and sculpture, I don't think work with NFT, but all of this other work is that you're doing it, I think is extraordinary and lends itself perfectly. And I just want to say one quick thing. When I went to the um, 
the Smithsonian Museum of Design, everybody said to me, design is defined as elite, expensive, and that works well. And I said, wait a minute, what about design that is not elite, not expensive, and doesn't work well? And we did the first show ever as design for the other 90% that ended up at the UN that were things like the straw that's used in Africa that use, use that filters the poison out of water and the rolling bottles to carry water over long distances. And we did it in the dirt of the lawn of the Cooper Hewitt Museum. And it traveled around the world and it was the first non-beautiful, cheap, under $100 design objects. And it totally changed. It was almost all by women. And it was extraordinary exhibition that went to the UN and ended up being funded internationally by UN NFT and NGOs. Anyway. But, but Fantastic. It, it, it was even just at the, um, there was a very big um, UN conference here in, in Kenya and Nairobi mm -hmm. um, on the environment. It's called the UN, UNEP, I think is how they pronounce it. And it made, it made a lot of news because um, the 193 countries at this meeting agreed on a developing a treaty to not just reduce plastic waste, but to eliminate it, which means that they're going to go up against big business, right? So, but the main art piece that was there was this um, constructed sculpture, structure, whatever, of a water tap um, with a bunch of plastic coming down and then spread across the lawn, which was really powerful. It was a powerful and appropriate piece to see in that space. But it was by a white Canadian, um, you know, artists who flew to Kenya when there are Kenyan artists who are actually working on sustainable art here as well, who don't always get that same opportunity. And so, um, yeah, I just, I, I, I hope that the more traditional art world um, doesn't shy away from this NFT movement because if they got it right, if they really get into it, they use their art, they create collections, they create communities, they create utilities, it could actually, you know, if it continues to generate funding, it could actually fund this new art world that you're talking about, that people create their own galleries, their own community, their own system for women, middle-aged women artists who, who don't have places to showcase their work. If a group of middle-aged white women came together oh, and created an tell, NFT tell collection me what, that tell, me what the <laughs> tell me what the name of your program is. I'm gonna put it on my Facebook. Well, I just, I'm, I'm just announcing it. Like I'm not actually really ready to do it, but I did start my Twitter page. It's called Arts Envoy because my work is around using art to make social change. Um, so I do have a Twitter. If anybody wants to follow it, it's Arts Envoy NFT, but I would love it when I'm ready. If you all want to get involved, help promote it or whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to launch it on April 21st, which is um, World Creativity and Innovation Day. Fantastic. But I do think, I do think um, it's an, it, even if you don't agree with it, you don't want to be involved in it or whatever, it's an interesting ecosystem to observe. And if you, like for me, I wasn't even planning to do anything, but once I got myself in it, I was like, oh, I can use this to create the change that I actually want to see independently. I don't have to get funding from a foundation or whatever. I can create this collection. Mm -hmm. I, I have a following. I think I can sell out on it and then use that money to create the sort of initiatives and programs that I want to see to help elevate artists, especially after what has been going on with this with this pandemic. So, Lisa, to this point, I would like to ask Sarah because she made, um, Sarah, would you like to ask that, you know, about the NFTs? Uh, I follow NFTs very uh, <laughs> daily. Um, you know, I, I'm really plugged in in that community. Um, I'm the co-chair deputy of um, the digital assets for STEP, which is the um, estate um, and trust practitioning global. So I hear you, but I hear both sides. <laughs> I hear both arguments. So the problem, and, and I have to make a disclosure here from the legal perspective. So the problem that we see is that it's a very nascent technology, right? and it's evolving through conversations like the one that you guys are having, right? But there are problems <laughs> because the NFTs are just code. 
you know, they are performative and a declarative code. It's really like um, a vending machine. If you do this, then that. They don't have in, in, it, in themselves protections. The real protection is in the metadata, but I today, and I do a lot of pro bono for artists, I still have to see an artist that will include a real legal contract to their picture. And I cannot tell you how important that is. You need to protect your IP um, because you do not actually want to sell anything. You don't want to let go of your IP rights and your copyrights. You absolutely do not want. You want to protect it. And if you do give up any copyrights or IPs, you need to be very clear on how you're going to be uh, rewarded for it because those royalties that um you know i appreciate that comment yes it is the future you know of a possible virtual artist stream of income but those royalties are only paid on chain and only on a virtual wallet what happens when you know i made the comment and, and forgive me if it's so trivial but you give limited licensing right of reprinting some of your work for commercial use or t-shirts you know even a museum you give the museum the right to, to publish some coffee table book beautiful stuff you will never see a penny out of that because that is off chain it doesn't have anything to do with your with your nft and so how do you protect yourself so please 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 add a real legal contract I yeah, I think I've seen, wait, wait, I've seen. I, I, need, I need to say this my friend Lynn Goldsmith is right now being sued by the Warhol Foundation in the Supreme Court for copyright issue of one of her images yeah and i will say that i know um there are some collections that have written in their in their smart contracts that if the commercial um value of whatever these holders want to use is above a certain amount of money then they are required to get in touch and i'm assuming that means that there's a different contract that's written up um but you're you know you're right it's all on the chain and if anything else happens but i think that's up to you know that's up to the artist to figure out how to negotiate it. Some collections are like, once you buy the NFT, you have the rights, you can do whatever, you can make money off of it, you can create whatever. And then other people, and, and they're fine with just the royalties for the resales. Um, and then some people are, I think, putting a cap, just saying, listen, if you if you are able to make $100,000 off my NFT, then, then, you know, then, then we have to renegotiate that contract. And I think that's probably when it goes off the smart contract, off the chain into a more typical IP, um, thing, but the, uh, the IP thing is also an interesting thing because people are ripping off people's materials and creating collections. Even right now, I'm like, I, I, I actually don't know because you know, I'm like, okay, 3D NFT collections are becoming more popular because they're a step away from the metaverse. Can I, for example, create a 3D uh, figure in Blender and use that? image for my nft collection but intellectual property rights stuff i don't even think has been fully fleshed out yeah. in how it all works no it's, it's a wild not. wild open it is world. but you know but you know you have a lot to lose which is your artwork you know which is you you know your artwork is you like you know i'm not an artist but i would say you know if you write a book that's you it's a piece of you if you if you yeah, if but if you, you're a digital artist you lose your work anyway like i have i can't tell you how many young poets write beautiful stuff they put it on facebook they don't get monetized for none of it facebook right. makes money off of their content so for digital artists people who work in the digital space i do think this isn't like creating a book this isn't i even i used to sell dvds there are no more dvd sales so no. how do i make money you know once i create a film and i get a little bit of money to make the film there's no royalties or anything at the end of it so so and even people are like going crazy about nfts they're like oh i'll just put all my work on the on the blockchain i'm like that's not even it because you have to buy into this collector's mentality that's how people are making money off of this, which goes back to what Barbara was saying, that it's like a financial, you know, utility more so sometimes there is really bad NFT artwork, really bad. And they're making millions of dollars, millions. Yes. There's well, also maybe, beautiful artwork. Maybe I, artists need to do what Sarah's saying, just do that extra step of getting the legal thing. 
in order to make money and then preserve their artwork because that's what my generation learned is to write copyright and the date on their artwork and now no one can resell it and they learned it they all do it and they now have copyright but yes, again thank you. I, thank you sarah and thank you for but for again for those people that or artists that don't know they're not so tech chronological what happens this is another you know this is all good for people that are very very technological but for this is part of my utility this is what i'm going to build in is i'm going to teach people from that's, the very first step on how to become a collector or how to become a creator because i'm very techy i have done you know udemy programming i edit my own films i'm very techy and it was still challenging for me, but I'm a good translator. So I know how to take complicated, I work for the UN. I know how to take complicated ideas and break them down. And that's what I want my collection to be, not just about ensuring mm -hmm. women are doing well in this space, but ensuring, I've said this several times, we leave no artist behind. Yeah. The, the artists who are actually the creators are not the ones who are missing out on this, on this revolution or this movement. Yeah. Uh, but Lisa, just I, I really beg you, if you know the story of Robert Indiana, who was an artist from the 60s, he did not put copyright and the date on his artwork. He lost the word love, you know, the big word love? That's his. He lost all rights to all his artwork. So just if you could, when you teach people, just figure out and learn how to get the copyright and put that in your teaching. Because you oh. okay, can teach artists how to use this, but well, as Sarah said, and my generation learned, you're gonna, they're gonna potentially those that learn what you learn and your artist groups, mm -hmm who you're you're brilliant to do this are going to potentially those that are, will make a lot of money and and you're helping them so much could potentially be losing tens hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars by not copywriting what they're doing no, and i i absolutely agree with you but one of one of the things that i think is is going to be a perk to the way the nft collections are made when they have these like smart contracts is what they're called is if you hire a lawyer to help you with the ip rights or whatever in that contract every i i make so many films a year because i make short format films and i work all the time i do not have enough money to go hire a lawyer to get cop to copyright my material or get trademarks or do all of that stuff, nor do I have the money to go up against somebody like GE Healthcare who screwed all, me. All you have um, to do you know is what I put mean? copyright and the date. Well, no, I understand no. that, but if they break that copyright, like MTV, for example, this was notorious for filmmakers who used to work as freelancers for MTV. MTV would sign contracts with filmmakers and then break them, like pay them like less than they were planning to, knowing that this filmmaker is not going to have enough money to hire a legal team to go after MTV. So it's also, I understand in principle, it's a good idea. And I'm hoping the way that the NFT contracts work, that it's like, we just have to say it once it's, it's, just, it's written in, but, but when, when it comes to an independent artist, um, and you, you're challenged and you say, okay, you broke my, you, you broke agreements. You, you stole my trade secrets. You've done whatever with IP. I, I can't necessarily go after you because I don't have the resources to hire a legal team to do that or spend the time getting legal aid. You know what I mean? It's, it's complicated, but I'm okay, hoping. There, there is volunteer lawyers for the art. No, I know, all but I'm saying I mean, you is, know. please, all I'm saying is it's great advice. Please put it in there. Yes. It, 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 you know, that's all I'm saying. And before, before going uh, towards then after we, we can have some more time, Sarah, I will come back to you. Now uh, I would like to present because, you know, Lisa is a nearby neighbor to Affinity uh, Gallery in Lagos. We have five artists. Um, we have two artists from South Africa and um, three from Nigeria. Yeah, so we the exhibition opens next week, Saturday and Sunday. Um, and basically the exhibition is about womanhood and explores what it is specifically being an African woman artist in the industry today, but not just today as well, but looking and learning through the lens of history. 
and how um, in the historic, in the art historical canon, how African art by women has been perceived, how it's been preserved, how it's even still looked at today in present times as well. So we're trying to take a complete view of um, of African art by women, but then also in modern times discuss what that means and what kind of art African women are, are creating. Um, and how that interacts with society and how society treats African women anyways um, in, in, in today's society. So yes, it's a very interesting um, exhibition with different mediums. We have an installation artist. Um, we have um, an artist who draws with charcoal. We have a painter who uses um, gold leaf. And then we have another artist who uses lace and embroidery. So it's very interesting texture and materials which also shows the breadth of womanhood as well. And they all have different meanings and different um, perspectives, which is very interesting. I have an artist who's very militant, you know, in her feminism. And I have another one who approaches it from a very delicate standpoint, um, mm -hmm. very sensual. So it's very interesting to see like the breadth of emotion and the breadth of understanding and perspectives that African women can have. Like we're not a monolith, you know, we're not one thing. Um, so this exhibition, I think, really hones in on that. And we hope that people, like, the takeaway they get from the exhibition is that they they see women as diverse, um, but also have conversations about how we've been treated, filling the art canon over, the, over time, and how we can change that now, and hopefully create something that today's artists can look on 20, 50, 100 years from now and be like, okay, we, we saw from the past, we learned, and then we created change. Of, of, uh, because you have a quite a beautiful space, uh, the Affinity Gallery. In total, we have about um, 20 pieces. Like I said, we have an installation piece that is quite large. And then we have obviously paintings and drawings um, from the different artists. So in all, about 20 pieces. Fantastic, fantastic. And uh, so, Lisa, for now you have many, many women <laughs> to approach nearby. <laughs> yes, so that's uh, that's uh, that's something amazing because I I want to. But what are the challenges, Moni, as uh, being also an, uh, a curator in in uh, Lagos, for instance? Could you tell us your 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 point of view? Um, so I'm I'm not a full time curator. But mm -hmm. just from um, being in the art scene and just understanding the art scene, I think for us, it's a very small, um, small industry. Um, everyone knows everyone. Um, but I think the pandemic was, was a bit of a turning point for that industry in Lagos. And um, I think it granted agency to a lot of artists. Now I think there's a lot more freelance curators than before. Um, and I don't want to use the word gatekeeping because I think it's a little bit of a buzzword. Um, but previously there were like very few galleries or um, art organizations that were doing things in the art space that people thought were worth, you know, like were worthy. Um, but I think during the pandemic, when everyone was kind of quiet, it gave rise to these new um, curators who are not necessarily like attached to any gallery or any institution and they didn't need that legitimacy from a brick and mortar space or like a space that has like you know that's established so i think it's very interesting and it's opened up um the art space here um very quickly we we it remains to be seen you know the pros and the cons of of this long term but at the moment i think it's very interesting to observe um and also the pandemic everything went global very fast a lot of young artists are showing digitally and in person around the world very quickly now like versus before like i said there are less gatekeepers so to speak now um so i think that's very interesting there's now if now artists like i don't know someone mentioned that i think barbara they come together put on a show by themselves like four or five artists are like why wait for a gallery or why wait for an institution and they get a space for like three days five days a week and they put on a show invite people online and people show up so i think it's very interesting to see what's going on now in the art space here in lagos scotland chris christine i can see you <laughs> christine is an amazing painter about celebrating women 
and uh, she had a beautiful article on on our magazine. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hello, Christine. How are Hi. you? I, I'm a middle-aged white woman. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I I'm like. too. I'm too. <laughs> okay. So I emerge onto the art scene, which is uh, so it's quite interesting to uh, hear the views and the ideas. That it, I, I admit um, it's quite hard to get people to take you seriously as a middle-aged white woman. They kind of think you're past your best. And in actual fact, um, you're at your best. You actually know what's happening. Uh, you've got viewpoints, you've got opinions, and you've seen people age and people disappear through aging as a woman. And I, it's quite a fascinating subject. Yes. And also, Is that your artwork behind it you? Is. Yes. I, yes, it is. That's uh, my. The one that you can see, I think, is uh, one strings, and it's my comment on marriage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, it comes with strings and manipulates, <laughs> pulls in all directions. So I, I tend to do uh, work which uh, comments on um, basically, I suppose, um, women and fe female situations and relationships. That's, that's kind of where I go from. No, they're, they're beautiful. And Christine wrote a beautiful piece on the, on the... Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now I'm going to London with Farah. That she's been very active in writing so many wonderful comments. Farah, how is... Uh, in, in, uh, from your point of view, what do you see? Well, um, uh, first of all, as I've written in the comments, Barbara, I was just sitting here going, yes, yes, when you were saying all this stuff about how artists need to make their own way and avoid having to go through the disgustingly stifling uh, structure that the art world has. And it is all about the money. It's all about which artists that they can manipulate and make the most money out of. So I appreciate everything that you're saying. I've just joined your Facebook as well. So I'll see you on there and I'm happy. I'll be shouting, you know, say yes, yes, you're right. But anyway, um, it's fascinating to see all of you empowering women on here, sharing your art in the way that you are and, you know, hearing about women only exhibitions from money and uh, affinity gallery it's fantastic and um sarah and lisa i'm really excited about what you're saying regarding the nft market because um i'm exploring um uh, kind of like getting into it as well using my um via my art meets poetry project and that is to empower artists and poets and create um the smart contracts where there will be foundations which will benefit. Um, so we're trying to tick all the boxes, but trying to do it exactly in a, in a safest way possible so everybody's protected with proper smart contracts. So we're, we're delving into it, but there is a lot of good impacts that we can make in terms of helping artists benefit and poets and you know creators benefit from it by giving them support because the NFT world is so overwhelming. It is very overwhelming and scary. You know, you hear about the open seas debacle that happened a few weeks ago, and everyone's, you know, wallets are, you know, um, contaminated. You know, the list is endless of things that you hear. So it's scary, but it's exciting as well. And you know, then you have that feeling of FOMO, don't you? <laughs> you don't want to miss out either. So um, I haven't created bear apes or anything like that. You know, that's not my thing at all. <laughs> But I'm just, you know, exploring it. And I've got um, a couple of collaborators that are amazing who are already very um, into the NFT space and they're all over Discord and all kinds of different things. And I mentioned Discord in the chat, which is really, hopefully we can empower other artists and I'm still learning, but it is exciting, but it isn't, you know, it's not selling my traditional art on the NFT space. It's going in a different direction, but you know, I'm open to different suggestions, but it is, it is a bit scary as well. So, you know, step, little baby steps. <laughs> No, it is. And I, you know, I'm, I, like I mentioned, I'm very techie. So even for me, this is really challenging. Yeah. Um, and I work with artists here, like, you know, who don't have enough money to buy enough bundles to yeah. even get on discord. You know what I mean? Like the, the digital divide creates such a disconnect between yeah. the artist 
um, who don't have access and the ones who are a lot more in the digital space. But I think like for me, the solution is, um, is, is instead of trying, because, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Kenya working with the UN and they're really behind this NFT stuff. Um, but what they're trying to do is, is think about getting local artists here up to speed technically with some of this stuff. And I was like, man, like these graffiti artists I work with, no way. Like they can barely yeah. get, do yeah. do little like social media stuff. There's no way you can expect them to get to this level. Yeah. But what I think is a great opportunity is that instead, like I had been talking about the, to Mombasa County um, government here, because they're trying to revive tourism. It's like, let's create, you know, artist residencies where we bring artists from the global North who are, comfortable in this digital space and build partnerships with amazing i mean i i don't know i had a nigerian roommate this guy laulu who's an incredible nigerian artist but the the creators on this continent are incredible in right. music art fashion it's just it's 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 incredible and and i do think that there's an opportunity again to create partnerships or collections that are bringing these cross-cultural yes. things together where they both benefit. I mean, we obviously don't want to, we don't want to set up situations where Global North artists are making the money and just, you know, not elevating the, the artist here. But if we could figure out a program or some sort of something that, that the tools are eventually going to become more user friendly. They're going to create programs. They're going to create apps. They're going to create platforms that are going to make this streamline into a much easier way. But in the meantime, instead of creating a further disconnect because of this digital divide, why don't we find ways to bring analog? I know we talked, yeah, analog artists more together with digital artists and create, you know, other opportunities because what some of these collections are doing also is they're like, well, this is our main collection, but then we're going to commission different artists to do a special three NFT piece collection that has, you know, something related to the, the overall theme of the collection. So they're giving work to creators and then those creators are also getting royalties for that NFT collection. And so if the, the people who are leading in the space or who understand how to create and, and create collections in the space could could embrace other creatives, either offline or, or online, I think we could see a really dynamic way of elevating a lot of artists using this this platform. No, that's fantastic, Lee. Lisa, that's brilliant, because at the end of the day, it's people like you who are gonna bridge the gap and help those who need. You wanted to ask anything else to Lisa or to Barbara or to Farah? So. Just, I, yeah, I just, and, and you know, I, I normally use LinkedIn, but I am, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable about, you know, social media. Like there is Twitter, there is Discord. I'm part of a DAO now. There is, so if you get me on LinkedIn, you know, that's that's the place to go. So I know it's work related. Um, and I did share with you, Carolina, um, the, a sample of a free NFT IP contract. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can I can share more information. Like I can give you as much as I can. Like I'm all for uh, pro bono and and helping because at this point in time, it's all about collaboration. But uh, one of the things that I wanted to you know, the, it's astounding to me that such a complex technology like blockchain is being <laughs> is being talked about, and and I can see more of what is wrong about um, you know people talking about this technology in the media that what is right so please be very careful when you're reading any articles uh, that are not from real uh, tech sources because you will get a lot of misinformation out there and to the point that Lisa was bringing up which is a really important point is collaboration because mm -hmm. I mean Lisa is fantastic she has this I mean it's, it's awesome to actually meet a tech <laughs> like a tech savvy artist you know because even digital artists themselves are not quite savvy in the code you know, not just because you're a digital artist and, and you can make a program about your art, you can actually write code. And so I have actually met a lot of um, coders and programmers uh, that actually create NFTs, that create backdoors for their own, um, you know, royalties in perpetuity. So be extremely mm -hmm. careful. You know, it's funny how a trustless system like, you know, the blockchain 
is supposed to be. It's all about trust. Like, who do you trust to write those things, right? The and they have ethical and and moral boundaries. Mm -hmm. you know, they yes. Have so I just want to say something. Go ahead. The largest population right now alive are boomers. And everything you're talking about, about NFT, none of the boomers are going to get into or understand. The largest population of women artists aren't going to go near <laughs> NFT. They're busy <clears throat> making their art that has nothing to do with NFTs. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that are not getting into museums or galleries or reaching collectors. That's quite right. And they're the ones that are making their art. And with the exception of Christine um, and a few artists like Christine, whose work is terrific, and you'd actually love Florine Stenheimer, who wrote a wonderful poem that I'm, it's only four lines. They like a woman to have a mind. They are of greater interest, they find. They aren't very young women of that kind. Um, so a lot of this program, which has been fascinating and very useful to a lot of artists, has been about NFTs. But unfortunately, most women artists in this world aren't going to use NFTs and it's not going to help them. And that, it, you know, that's, it is going to help a lot of people. And mm -hmm. that's great. But that I, I'm, it's really a sad position right now in the arts for a lot of women artists who are not able, who many of them were very successful in their 20s and 30s, mm -hmm. who unless they're 90 years old or older, can't get a gallery, can't get shown. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. But you know what, coming back, uh, I think you are absolutely right. And uh, again, also with Sarah, what she says, it's important now, it's the collaboration between all of us, because there are so many platforms, so many things that are, uh, that, have, you know, every week, every day, Sarah can, can, can see, uh, you know, there are so many things that are coming to us with blockchain, as you said, that's why I did this, Sarah, maybe you missed it, the one on uh, with Nanne, Nanne Deking was uh, at the beginning, he was really the, 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 what, the guru of uh, the blockchain. I think, you know, before in any case going anywhere to the metaverse, I think we should live well this life and uh, and and change what we, we can change now and, and maybe later in the metaverse. But um, I, I adore any of your, of your, here we have Iskra who is asking to do an art talk on money. Yes, Iskra, maybe we can do that. <laughs> That's very oh, yeah. That's oh, very yeah. important. And then when you do that, talk about the tax-free countries where all the collectors are put, sending their artwork where they don't have to pay taxes, where yes. they sell it and buy it. Yes, yes, definitely. We will do one on, on that one too. And, and also we have another um, uh, artist, Maria. I don't know if you are driving or you are anywhere because Maria also is uh, doing amazing. She's Carolina. Hi, yes, Maria. Hello. No, I'm painting actually. <laughs> hey, you're painting. Can we see you? Yeah, hold on. I don't know if uh, how my hair is or not there because I was like. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I was just painting and listening. It's so interesting. I try to do NFTs actually, and it's not very easy for me. It's, uh, it is not very easy. Uh, but I just keep painting and doing five arts, and I think I will have to ask for help one day or pay, pay somebody. It's no, it's complicated to, to connect everything. I don't know, maybe it's me, but what do you think, Carolina? Yes, I, I think you know we 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 should uh, we should, uh, as I said, I think it is a way. If uh, if uh, I, I would do it with Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Because I think you know, when whenever you you need to understand where are you going, and as Sarah is saying, it's very tricky and very important to know what are your rights after that. So uh, last Saturday, exactly, I have three women artists. Um, one from uh, from UK who is living in Switzerland. One from Berlin, and uh, one. German 
who lived in has lived in Switzerland is not living anymore. So and they are wonderful works and just one painting by one male artist, but who is a so-called um he's a classic modern artist. He and the work is from 1919, so it's quite uh, an, an, an early work. And the combination, I think, is very interesting. But what I wanted to say to Barbara, I thought what you said was really interesting and it's the truth. I mean, I only can 100% agree to what you said, but also to Sarah, that we have to, to find also, you know, not everything which comes by NFT is really safe for us or is available for us or and so on and so on. Uh, what I wanted to say that the art history right now is also to Barbara and the art market, they are two different things. You know, the art market is, as you said, the 200 uh, artists who are exhibited everywhere and they are getting all well, the awards and the prizes and so on. They are at the, normally at the Biennale or wherever. But the art history, these are the wonderful and good artists everywhere. In Berlin, for example, I mean, there are hundreds of female artists who are not seen or hardly seen because they are yeah they're not represented by big galleries and if you don't have a name or if you're not linked to uh, one of the name of the famous uh, fa famous uh, galleries then you are somewhere in the crowd and you get lost so i think we have to do a lot to promote female artists and also to buy female artists and but not only because they are female or they are women, but because they are good. Yeah, it's the question of really of uh, quality, not of quantity, not of gender. I mean, I can't understand all these stupid discussions. I mean, the major thing for me is good art is quality. But if I have to decide between a good painting by a, by a woman artist and a good painting by male artist, I think I, we should go to the first one. Yeah, this is just what I want to say. And um, yeah, all the all the people, all the the what you said were quite interesting. And I mean, it's it's always wonderful, uh, Carolina, that you put all these people together from all over the world, and you get the idea. Hey, there are always the same problems everywhere. It's just like I don't know. You can't escape. I mean, we have to struggle and we have to be connected. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Erika. Thank you, thank you. So I think we almost, you know, we had some some beautiful glimpses from different, you know, different from my curatorial to to a wonderful, uh, you know, artist uh, to to Sarah. That thank you, thank you, thank you for being us and, and you know from the legal part as a, you know and technical part. Uh, so it is, it is as uh, Erika said. We are all from different parts of the world today, but with the same <laughs> issues. So we hope that one day, you know, and we, I think soon, you know, there is there is hope. Always hope is the last to die. This is what it is. We are we are going through very challenging moments, and we hope, you know, again, our prayers are all with every families that are affected by any war. I have to say, in, around the world. Mm -hmm.